Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. Spiritualist Eckhart Tolle said in the face of death, especially violent death, things don't make sense anymore. It's a simple yet painfully accurate statement, and it's especially true for murders in small towns. People who live in small towns feel insulated. They are close to one another. They think they know each other. And when a violent murder happens, it echoes through the town like a pebble skipping across a pond. How could this happen here? And while the seeds of distrust are sown, pitting neighbors against each other, folks will still insist that the killer had to be an outsider. And when a local is publicly suspected by law enforcement, well, the modern-day pitchforks come out in force. But what if the wrong person is accused? The gossip, the embarrassment, the shame, these feelings don't dissipate quickly. A wrongful accusation can be devastating and destructive. And the fear that flows through a small town after a shocking murder can be just as dangerous people begin to arm themselves, selling out gun stores. This can lead to even more tragedy with accidental shootings by frightened townsfolk. The small town of Cherryville, North Carolina suffered two horrific double murders in the summer of 1991. The shocking brutality was bad enough, but the town was further traumatized by two more deaths. Deaths that were a direct result of the murders in the small community. Cherryville recovered and survived, just like the trees it's named for. The blossoms died quickly, but the tree regrew. However, the scars remained on the delicate branches. Welcome to episode 120, The Cherryville Murders. Cherryville, North Carolina, sits just 40 miles outside of Charlotte, but seems worlds away from the bustling city. The area was settled by German, Dutch, and Scotch-Irish colonists in the year of 1792. They came from the colony of Pennsylvania on land grants from King George III. The original settlement was known as White Pine, and a village developed at the crossroads of the Morganton to Charleston Road. The construction of a railroad going westward from the village was interrupted by the Civil War. And the town that would come to be known as Cherryville was a terminus throughout the war for western railroads in North Carolina. Cherryville is in Gaston County, named for William Gaston, member of the U.S. House of Representatives and Justice of the Supreme Court of North Carolina. Catawba and Cherokee Native Americans originally inhabited the lands of Gaston County but very few remained as the European colonists arrived. Throughout the 1700s, the town was a place of trade, with one of the major trading roads connecting North Carolina and South Carolina passing through the establishment center. Gaston was known as the Banner Corn Whiskey County of Carolina by 1870 because corn was one of the more abundant crops in the area and was quickly converted to whiskey. In addition to distilleries, the county's early economy was supported by mines that yielded gold, lime, sulfur, tin, and iron. The town that came to be known as Cherryville was used as a stopping point for water and coal for the Coastal Seaboard Railroad line in the 1860s. A local resident of the area began to plant cherry trees along the railroad route, which eventually inspired the name of Cherryville when the town was incorporated in 1881. The town was a center for agriculture, which supported its economy for many years until it developed a rich textile industry in the 1800s. By the 1900s, the city transformed into a mill town, with several mills from the textile and factory industries springing up and providing jobs for the people of Cherryville. The small town's German heritage is celebrated every year in a tradition called Shooting in the New Year. The tradition was much more widespread during colonial and antebellum times, and by 2006, 
only parts of Lincoln and Gaston counties participated. At the stroke of midnight, a designated crier would holler, Hello! to warn people in nearby houses before the shooters began a rhyming chant, and then they fire off their muskets. The chant was part sermon and part good wishes for the upcoming year. Then the shooters were usually invited into nearby homes for refreshments. In 1963, the Cherryville New Year's shooters were federally charted. In modern times, the New Year's shoot is considered a combination of English and German folk customs, though coming primarily from the German tradition of shooting guns to ward off evil spirits. And the Pennsylvania Dutch used to shoot at their fruit trees on New Year's Eve to ensure a good harvest. You can learn about the Cherryville shooters and many other town traditions at the Cherryville Historical Museum on Main Street. Cherryville has held on to its time-honored traditions and small-town life. With many of the mills shut down or moved out of the county, the people remained. Not much has changed. Since 2010, the town has had a population of around 5,000 people. It's definitely small-town Mayberry, where daily life follows a slow pace and everyone knows their neighbors and support one another in difficult times. At least it used to be this way. People say a lot changed in Cherryville in the early 1990s when the sleepy southern town, known for its beautiful cherry trees and tight community, suffered the trauma of four heinous murders in the summer of 1991. I'm going to pause now for a short commercial break. After attending their usual church service on Sunday, July 28th, Fred and Margaret Davis got a ride home from a friend. It was a typical sunny July morning, and 68-year-old Fred looked forward to gathering some vegetables from his field to carry over to his son and daughter-in-law's house once he returned home. Fred was a retired mechanic for the State Highway Department, who farmed on the side to keep himself busy and support his family. 67-year-old Margaret worked part-time at a mush house, a factory for making sausages. The couple lived surrounded by family, with Margaret's brother and sister living just a mile up the road from them and their daughter and son-in-law living around the corner from their house. It was convenient for this very close-knit and loving family. Later in the day, Fred stopped by his son's house to deliver his daughter-in-law, Kathy, some fresh veggies, and chat with his son, Steve. In the afternoon, the Davis' daughter, Ruth, spoke with her mother at the Davis property and spotted her father working in the nearby field. Ruth had no way of knowing that this would be the last time she would ever see her beloved parents alive. At around 6 p.m. that evening, Ruth returned to her parents' home to retrieve a vacuum cleaner that she had meant to grab earlier. When she got there, no one seemed to be home, but the back door was unlocked, so she let herself into the house. After grabbing the vacuum, she left through the back door again and walked the short distance back to her own home. The next morning, on July 29th, Ruth and her seven-year-old son stopped by Fred and Margaret's house. To their horror, they stumbled onto a bloody scene. Fred and Margaret had been bludgeoned to death. The Rutherford County Sheriff's Department arrived on the scene shortly after the gruesome discovery. The Davis farm was technically in Cherryville, but far enough out that it was in Rutherford County, not Gaston. Margaret's body was found in the kitchen, her head and face covered in blood. Fred was found in the den, near the television set, which was still on, with the volume blaring. Like his wife, Fred's head was covered in blood, and it appeared he had been beaten with some object. The bodies of Mr. and Mrs. Davis were autopsied the next day on July 30, 1991. Their wounds were extensive. Margaret had sustained six major lacerations on her scalp and face from the brutal attack. She suffered skull fractures and hemorrhaging of the brain, along with additional injuries to her left elbow and right hand. The coroner thought these injuries could have been from Margaret's attempts at self-defense or from falling to the kitchen floor. Mr. Davis had blood and brain tissue on his face, head, and clothing, 
and there was blood in his left eye. Twelve lacerations were found on his face and scalp, and his skull had been fractured, bashed inward. There were additional wounds to Mr. Davis's left hand, which the examiner believed could have been from self-defense or from his hand resting on the top of his head when the first blow occurred. The entire town of Cherryville was horrified at what had happened to the Davis couple. Murders didn't happen in this small town, especially the murders of a beloved elderly couple. Around the area and its surrounding cities, people were devastated. A longtime friend of the Davis family told the Washington Post, quote, I grew up with them and nobody ever had anything to say against them. If the church door ever opened on Sunday morning and Fred Davis wasn't there, I never heard about it. They were as fine as any people who ever lived around here. Owner of Terry's Grocery and Grill, Floyd Terry, told reporters that the Davises were, quote, good Christian people, spent all their lives here, came in the store all the time. It doesn't make any sense. It wasn't long into the investigation before police had a suspect in mind, Fred and Margaret's son-in-law. The Davis's daughter, Ruth, was married to a 29-year-old man named Joey James Melton. Melton was a high school dropout, and Fred and Margaret opposed his proposal to their daughter. But regardless, they supported their daughter and helped the newlyweds set up their new life together, first helping them secure a mobile home and later getting them into a house. Despite their disapproval, there were no major sources of tension between the Davises and their son-in-law. And yet, the police locked onto him early on in their investigation. To be fair, their tunnel vision wasn't completely out in left field. Joey Melton had a history of drug abuse and had received psychiatric treatment in the 80s. Floyd Terry said that the police, quote, were all over the place and all over him. I asked him straight out right after it happened, and he said, I couldn't do nothing like that. I couldn't. And even if I did, I wouldn't be crazy enough to let my wife go back there the next day. Despite their suspicions of Melton, investigators at the Rutherford County Sheriff's Department were without a motive for the crime, much less a shred of physical evidence connecting him to the scene. This did little to stop investigators from harassing Melton and making repeated, noticeable trips to his house for questioning. News traveled fast around Cherryville, that the sheriff's department suspected their son-in-law, Joey Melton. Weeks into the investigation, and still without any evidence linking him to the murder of his in-laws, the police pressure on Melton eventually relented a bit. That is, until September 9th, when a set of second murders were discovered. The investigation of Melton was immediately escalated. Officers began repeatedly visiting his home on the 9th, this time interrogating Joey Melton about his potential involvement in these new murders. By the next day, on September 10th, the stress of the investigation and the rumors circulating around the town became too much for Joey. He wrote a note to his wife and family before turning his shotgun on himself. The contents of the note were not revealed by police or the Meltons. Teresa Swink, one of Ruth's cousins, told reporters, quote, All we heard it said was that he loved his wife and kids and told his wife to take care of the kids. Residents of Cherryville were shocked by the death. A local retired farmer told the Washington Post, quote, The law killed that boy. They killed him, yes, sir. That boy had his troubles, but he didn't do what they said, and he didn't deserve what he got. The local sheriff refused to comment, likely worried about a civil suit from Ruth Mountain, Joey's wife. He did tell the Washington Post, quote, She's talked to us several times, and I think she's settled down now. I think she understands that what happened in this case was unavoidable. I'm not sure I entirely agree that it was unavoidable. By focusing only on Joey Melton, they put a target on his back. If they had kept investigating and looking for new leads, they might have caught the killer before the next murders. Sherry Terry, the grocer's daughter, said, quote, I still think a lot about Joey killing himself. I reckon he felt like everybody thought he did it, but if he could have just held on a couple more days. Joey had died by suicide just one day after the second set of murders. 
the renewed suspicion and harassment was more than he could bear. On the morning of September 9, 1991, almost six weeks after the murders of Fred and Margaret Davis, the bodies of E.Z. and Sarah Willis were found in their rural home a few miles outside of the town center. The Willises lived off a quiet and typical country road, surrounded by a patch of farmland, just like the Davises. But they were technically residents of Gaston County. Their daughter, who lived in the home next to them, was a 34-year-old accountant named Sheila Willis Hauser. She stopped by her parents' home on that September morning to check in on her parents, only to find a horrific scene eerily similar to that of the Davis home in late July. Sheila told the Washington Post, quote, You can't imagine what it was like. I haven't been back to the house since. I can't go in. It's difficult to imagine the trauma she suffered at finding her parents that way. I've lost my own parents, and the last image I have of them is burned into my mind. It sickens me to think that Sheila would have to live with this image of her parents in her mind. Sheila went on to say, quote, Things like this don't happen in Cherryville. My parents always worked hard, as hard as anybody. Elderly makes it sound like they couldn't look after themselves. They were working people. 71-year-old EZ and 67-year-old Sarah had been bludgeoned to death in their home after an intruder entered their bedroom through a window. It appeared that he had torn open the screen of the window and yanked it out to get into the couple's bedroom. Though the killer gained entry through the bedroom, the couple were found in the kitchen, and Easy had apparently gotten a few licks in with his cane. Easy was a retired auto repair shop mechanic who, despite walking with a cane, was still a spry family man. Sarah worked at one of the local mills still in operation. Their daughter, Sheila, understandably bristled at her parents being called elderly. Because despite their ages, both still worked steadily, and her father had been patching up his own garage roof just the week before, despite using a cane for walking. The similarities between the Davis and Willis murders were abundantly clear. Both couples were strikingly close in age, living within a few miles of Cherryville. Both couples were known as devoted churchgoers and active members of their communities. The Davis and Willis homes, though broken into, were left undisturbed, without any appearance of a robbery or theft-related motive. The television set in the Willis home, just like the Davis home, was left on blaring loud. Each murder had taken place between a Sunday evening to early Monday morning, and the couples had been brutally beaten to death with a blunt object. I'm going to pause now to hear a word from today's sponsors. The second set of murders sent the city of Cherryville into a tailspin, with local newspapers reporting that the town was in hysterics. Gossip spread like wildfire, as the town's usual easygoing chatter turned to heartbreak and paralyzing fear. Residents of Cherryville attempted to make sense of the killings, with rumors circulating that the murders had been a part of a cult ritual spurred on by the unique shape of both the Willis and Davis couple's driveways. Sheila Hauser, daughter of the Willises, was forced to hear speculation about her mother's injuries, including a rumor that her mother had been raped by the intruder, a claim that was unsupported by the evidence and denied by law enforcement. Scared neighbors and frightened townsfolk began reporting unsubstantiated incidents of prowlers and peeping toms to the police. This isn't unusual. In fact, after these kinds of killings, there are often accidental shootings of family members returning home late at night. The Cherryville police chief reported to the Washington Post, quote, Everybody was buying guns. Our officers became genuinely concerned about being shot themselves. When you go out at 2 o'clock in the morning and somebody is walking around outside a house with a gun, you don't know if it's a prowler or the homeowner. We finally had to tell our callers to stay inside until we got there. The chief also wrote an article in the local newspaper in an effort to dissuade the locals from walking around with their newly purchased guns, asking whether they were truly ready for the responsibility and mental toll of taking a life. 
Ferguson's Hardware on Main, the local hardware shop, couldn't keep ammunition, deadbolts, or locks stocked on their shelves. Following the loss of her parents, Sheila Hauser arranged for a service to be held at a local funeral home where she was met with 1,500 mourners. When asked what she would say to her parents' killer, given the chance, Sheila told reporters through tears, quote, I want him to know God doesn't make mistakes. This person needs to find a church, and he needs to find God, so that when he dies, he can go to heaven and tell my mama and daddy that he's sorry. The fear that an intruder would sneak into their homes at night plagued residents of the surrounding towns as well. An 84-year-old man named Douglas Shank Tips had been married to 81-year-old Elizabeth Tips for decades, and they lived in a mobile home a little outside of Cherryville. Shank Tips used to own a juke joint of sorts. He put a jukebox in a house he owned and brewed and sold what a Catawba County Sheriff called a little squeezin', another word for white lightning or moonshine. The sheriff said, quote, It wasn't exactly legal, but it's accepted in this part of the country. Like many older couples in and around Cherryville, Shank and Elizabeth Tips spent the weeks following the murders of the Davises and Willises growing increasingly scared. Shank began sleeping with a loaded rifle next to his bed, waiting for the minute an intruder might enter his home, ready to defend himself and his wife. On September 19th, in the early morning hours, Shank heard a noise in the bedroom that he shared with Elizabeth and suddenly felt a hand grip his leg. In a moment of pure terror, Tips grabbed the rifle and began firing into the dark around him. The air grew still and silent after the last shot rang out. As Shank peered into the darkness, he caught a glimpse of his wife's silhouette, bleeding out from one of the shots that had connected with her body. The first accidental shooting that local cops had been so worried about had happened. Elizabeth had gotten up to use the bathroom in the night, and upon her return had startled Shank, who had accidentally killed his wife in panicked terror. She was pronounced dead as members of the sheriff's department arrived on the scene. One of the officers present that night told the Washington Post, quote, He had seen all this stuff on TV. I think he had seen something that same night, and he just got spooked. He's still living over there in the trailer by himself. The whole thing's just a shame, and that's about all there is to it. Not that cold-blooded murder is ever easy to live with, but accidentally shooting your wife is worse than a nightmare. How do you move on from that? And the real murderer was still at large. Investigators worked any potential leads they had, but kept hitting dead end after dead end. It wasn't until days after the Willis murder that investigators finally caught a break. Like many other small rural southern towns, there was little to do in Cherryville besides working and hanging out at a friend's house to have a couple of drinks. In the wake of the Davis murders, some residents looking to distract themselves from the recent events through a party. It was at this party that one Cherryville resident would leave feeling uneasy. Sometime in late August, Jeff Hauser, a trucker, who as far as I can tell is not related to Sheila Hauser, the Willis's daughter, attended a small party where he met up with a couple of friends. One of these friends was a mill worker. After a few drinks, Hauser's friend began telling him a crazy story, confiding he had killed some people. At the time, Hauser thought his friend was just boasting about some made-up event and didn't think much of it when he left for a long-haul trucking job the next day. The Willises, the second couple, had not yet been murdered at the time, but by the time Hauser had returned from his trip, the couple had been found dead, and he began to feel uneasy about the drunken conversation he had had with his friend in the weeks prior. Jeff Hauser called the State Bureau of Investigation about the conversation that took place in late August. With a suspect in mind, the police compared prints that had been lifted off a window screen in the Willis's bedroom to the prints of a man named Philip Engel, Jeff Hauser's friend. To their surprise, the prints were a match. They had their man. 30-year-old mill worker, husband, and father of two, Philip Engel. 
Philip was a Cherryville native, having grown up in the area. His family had been there for three generations. His mother, Juanita Lambert, and his father split up shortly after Engel was born. Juanita Lambert was not around a lot while Philip was growing up, causing him to be passed around to relatives, leading a lonely life as a child. His troubled and traumatic childhood included being sexually molested by an older cousin. Philip had received psychiatric care in the 1980s, but had never had any consistent mental health treatment for his traumatic childhood experiences. Instead, Philip had grown up and moved on with his life, taking a job at the local Dora Mill, finding a wife, and settling down to make a family. Philip and his family lived in a mobile home park across the street from a popular church, Hull Baptist, where the Willis couple attended service every Sunday morning. Philip had attempted to check himself into a psychiatric facility following the Davis murders, the Broughton Hospital. But after he was examined by doctors, he was told to seek treatment for alcohol addiction privately. He showed up to work at the Dora Mill the day after the Willis murders with a gash on his face and told co-workers it was from falling while jumping on a trampoline. It was probably from Mr. Willis's cane. While Philip was known as a drinker, the community of Cherryville did not suspect that he could be capable of murdering four elderly people. Engel was arrested on Friday, September 20th, 1991. Once he arrived at the police department, he immediately confessed to the murders, describing each of them to police and detailing the weapons he used and where they could be located. According to Engel, the tire iron used to bludgeon the Willis couple could be found stored in his vehicle's trunk. He claimed to have dropped the axe handle used in the Davis murders in a field near their property. Police scoured the areas of brush in the fields surrounding the Davis home, but were never able to locate the axe handle. Instead, the investigators were able to spot a pocketbook that appeared to be partially burned. The only items missing from the Davis home after the murders was Margaret's pocketbook and a dress she owned. Police also found blood in the creases of the shoes that Philip had been wearing at the time of his arrest. The traces of blood matched the Willis's. Philip told investigators that the Davises had rented out their mobile home to him and his wife for a short period in 1987, but the couple never had any issues while they were the Davises' tenants. Engel was technically a distant cousin of the Willises, but had no other connection to them. According to the Rutherford County Sheriff's Department, Philip Engel admitted that he knew the couples, but never provided law enforcement with a motive for the brutal murders. The Rutherford County Sheriff told reporters that Engel, quote, stated that he did know both of the couples. That's the only relationship that we know of at this moment. Philip Engel's family members and residents of Cherryville were completely shocked by the arrest. In response, C.F. Engel, Philip's stepfather, told reporters that his stepson had never seemed violent. C.F. did admit that Philip, who was described as a typical mill worker and loner, suffered from blackouts when he drank too much. His step-uncle, Mike Engel Jr., said that Philip had been depressed around the time of the murders. Finally confident that they had their man, Gaston County police officers decided to hold a press conference following Engel's arrest, hoping to set the minds of Cherryville residents at ease. At the press conference, Officers explained to the public that the evidence they had collected thus far supported the fact that Philip Engel was the person responsible for the murders of Fred and Margaret Davis and E.Z. and Sarah Willis. Rumors had begun to spread in connection to the initial cult theory, including that the bodies of the victims had been mutilated and dismembered as part of a satanic ritual. Remember, this was about the height of the satanic panic. The Gaston County Police Captain told the press, quote, Because of the anxiety of many of our county residents, it is necessary to assure the general public that there is substantial evidence identifying Mr. Engel as the person responsible for these homicides. He announced that Philip Engel was charged with two counts of first-degree murder for the deaths of the Davis couple. 
a local farmer told a reporter, quote, they ought to give him a fair trial and hang him. Others feared that Philip Engel would be unfit for trial or proven innocent due to his mental state. Another local told reporters, quote, they're going to get that boy out of this somehow. They're going to get him a lawyer and make out like he's crazy, and it ain't right. He killed four good people. You can't kill him but once. Sheila Hauser said, I used to think the death penalty didn't do any good, but if you had seen your parents the way I saw mine, his family has called and said that he was suicidal when they locked him up, and they say he doesn't know why he did it and wants my forgiveness. I told them it's not my forgiveness he needs. While in jail, Philip met with a counselor, and he admitted that he thought he was doing God's work when he killed the elderly couples, stating that they had red eyes, horns, and tails. He explained that sometime between 6 p.m. and 8.45 p.m., he was driving around town before he decided to go to the Davis house. He parked out back, grabbed an axe handle from his truck, and entered the home through the unlocked door and into the kitchen. That was where he encountered Margaret, who he immediately began striking with the axe handle, hitting her over the head. Once Margaret had fallen to the kitchen floor, Engel went to the den where he found Mr. Davis watching TV in his recliner. He then beat Mr. Davis to death. I'm going to pause now to hear a final word from today's sponsors. Philip Engel was held in the central prison initially and then transferred to Wade in Gaston County Jail, where the second murders had occurred while awaiting trial. His presence in the Gaston County Jail reportedly caused trouble for the guards and other inmates as Philip Engel punched one of his cellmates in the face upon his arrival and was spit at and had things thrown on him by other inmates as he was escorted in. At his initial court appearances in both Gaston and Rutherford counties, Philip Engel was escorted silently by the police. Both judges refused to set bail for the suspected murderer due to the severity and brutality of the crimes. Because the Willis and Davis couples lived in different counties, the Gaston County District Judge ordered the prosecutors and detectives in the case to remain quiet about what had occurred on the night of the slayings. The Gaston County District Attorney decided to wait until the case in Rutherford County had been handled before they decided how to proceed with charges in their county. On November 12, 1992, the judge ruled that media attention and reports about the murders and Philip Engel's potential involvement had negatively impacted his ability to receive a fair and unbiased trial in the case. The trial was moved to Cleveland, North Carolina, a little over an hour away. It began in mid-February of 1993. Philip Engel's defense attorneys attempted a diminished capacity plea, claiming that he was suffering from a psychotic episode spurred on by borderline personality disorder the result of years of abuse as a child and drug abuse as an adult. The defense also presented evidence that Philip had watched his mother overdose as a child and witnessed her attempted suicide on multiple occasions, which negatively impacted his mental health. The defense team described how Philip had attempted suicide many times throughout his life, with his earliest attempt occurring at around the age of five or six when he hung himself from a tree. When he was 19, Philip shot himself in the stomach after drinking too much. The defense described how in the weeks leading up to the Davis murders, Philip Engel had gotten into an argument with his grandmother. The defense's psychiatric expert believed this could have started his psychotic episode, causing him to be triggered by the sight of Mr. and Mrs. Davis. The informant who had cracked the case for investigators, Jeff Hauser, testified to his late August conversation with Philip. According to Hauser, Engel told his friend, quote, Man, I killed two people. I beat them to death, before asking Hauser if he needed anyone dead. Jeff Hauser explained that he did not think Philip Engel was serious and jokingly pointed across the yard to his neighbor's house. When Philip started pressing Hauser for information about this neighbor, Hauser explained that he was only kidding and that the neighbor in question was a big guy who kept himself armed. 
In response to this, Philip said, quote, That doesn't matter. They'll never see me coming. All I need is an axe handle. When Jeff told the defendant to forget about it, Philip responded, Well, man, I wouldn't be telling you this, but I know I can trust you. Jeff Hauser detailed how, after the Willis's murder, Philip Engel had come around his home again, sporting a black eye. Jeff had a friend over that night who asked Philip what had happened, and he replied that he had fallen and hit a doorknob. Neither of the men believed his explanation, but they decided to let it go. When Philip asked Jeff if he was still having trouble with his neighbor, Philip told him, quote, I'll take care of him for you. I'll kill his whole family. I'll get a stick. I'll beat them to death. Philip went on to say, I love to watch people dying in agony, pain, suffering. Obviously, this was damning testimony for a diminished capacity defense. On September 17, 1993, Philip Engel was found guilty of first degree murder in the case of Fred and Margaret Davis on the basis of malice, premeditation, and deliberation. Two days later, on Friday, February 19th, the jurors deliberated for two hours and five minutes before determining that Philip Engel should receive the death penalty for the murders of Fred and Margaret. On July 29, 1994, Philip Engel appealed his sentencing for the Davis trial, which was denied. In the weeks leading up to his execution, Philip dropped all other appeals, stating that he was ready to die. His sister, Tina Thompson, requested that her brother's execution be postponed, saying that his decision to drop his appeals was another attempt in a long history of suicide attempts. Her request was denied. On September 22, 1995, Philip Engel was willed into the death chamber where he was executed by lethal injection. As he entered the chamber, he shouted, I'm going to heaven. In his final words, Philip Engel stated that he did not believe in the death penalty, but that he was ready to die, quote, so that the victim's family can maybe find some peace to put an end to what has happened. The husband and father of two was 34 years old. Following the arrest of Philip Engel, Sheila Hauser attempted to continue with her life, including preparing for Christmas and shopping for gifts for the holiday. One day, while shopping at Walmart, she was approached by a woman she didn't recognize at first. The woman embraced her in a long hug. Sheila Hauser told a reporter, quote, She asked me how I'd been and said she was hurting for me, and she said she was hurting too. She said she couldn't know how I felt. She said she was praying for me. Sheila broke the embrace and parted from the woman, finally recognizing that she had just been hugged by Philip Engel's mother. By the end of the summer in 1991, six different people had lost their lives as the result of the actions of Philip Engel. The panicked police targeted an innocent man who could not handle the hate and pressure he was receiving in the small town, and died by suicide. Joey Melton breaks my heart. His children break my heart. They will forever suffer not just his loss, but the trauma of their grandparents' violent murders. And Ruth lost her parents and her husband. The grief she and her kids experienced had to have been horrific, and trauma like that stays with you for a very long time. Douglas Shank Tips accidentally shot and killed his wife Elizabeth that September after the murders of the two elderly couples. At 84 years old, he was rightfully scared that he and his wife might be targets. The poor man died just six months later in February of 1992, perhaps mercifully, after living with the guilt and grief of accidentally shooting his wife. And I refuse to forget the grief and trauma experienced by Philip Engel's family, especially his wife and two children. Living your life as the child of a convicted murderer who was put to death by the state could not have been easy, especially in a small town. They didn't ask for this life. And you have to wonder if Philip had gotten the help he needed from his traumatic childhood, if his life would have been different. 
After the first murders, he tried to commit himself to a psychiatric hospital. I think he knew he was sick. His words to witness Jeff Hauser were horrific. I am not sympathizing with a serial killer. As always, I just wonder why. Why would Philip Engel target the Davis couple, a couple he knew and said he liked? And why the Willises, a couple he was distantly related to? Violent death rarely makes sense. But in true crime, we like to tie up our cases with neat little bows we call motive. But we can't always get what we want. All we can do for the people of Cherryville and the devastated families of the victims and killer is pray that they have finally found peace and hope that some 20 years later, those cherry tree branches have healed. Southern Fried True Crime is produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by me and Hannah Newcomb. The audio is edited and mixed by Chez Gray of Gray Multimedia. Southern Fred's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. Thank you to Annie Swink for suggesting this case. As some of you already know, Facebook shut down our lovely group. It happened overnight without warning or explanation, and it happened to many groups. But we have already started a new one. Search for Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group. We will still be worshiping our patron saint, Dolly Parton, sharing recipes, and in general, being supportive and good to each other. I still intend for it to be a safe and fun corner of Facebook, so the rule is still no shit asses allowed. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like Stitcher and Spotify, as well as Stitcher Premium, where you can listen ad-free. If you have any case suggestions, please email southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I do not accept case suggestions on social media private messages, but please feel free to reach out by email. Not only do I get my most interesting and little-known cases from listener suggestions, I love hearing from you guys. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.